very nice to see you all. Very nice to welcome everybody to this webinar today. We'll be talking about the seven deadly sins of, uh, of virtual teams. My name is Ina Togel. I am a professor of uh, leadership and organizational change at IMD. What I do is I lead custom programs uh, with customers and companies from different industries, different regions. And what I'm very interested in in my teaching is teams. Uh, what constitutes high performance teams and then how do these teams transform organizations? In particular, my passion uh, today is what, uh, what is the characteristics of uh, virtual teams and what is virtual communication? What kind of challenges does it present, but also what kind of opportunities does it present for teams? Um, I'm joined today, and it's my great pleasure to be joined by my colleague, Michael Yazici. He agreed to have a dialogue with me uh, today on this topic. Hi, Michael. Hi, Ina. Hello, everyone. Um, quick introduction to myself. I am a professor of strategy and leadership here at IMD, and I'm excited to be here. My role kind of is to be an interlocutor with Ina. Ina is the expert. Um, for me, this is a super interesting session because I work at the, at the intersection of strategy and leadership. And what we see is that more and more work is being done in implementing strategies in teams. And clearly virtual teams are becoming more and more important. So if we can figure out how to make them more effective, that'll be super important to, to us as individuals, but as well for our organizations. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, indeed, so let me just share a little bit about the next hour, right? So what, what we're going to do in the next hour is we're going to spend some a few minutes at the beginning introducing the topic, you know, what, it, what are virtual teams uh, about? I, especially in the last few weeks, many of us have been working virtually. We'll also start uh, or dive in uh, with a short breakout session. So we'll make groups of four uh, for a few minutes. Many of you may not be prepared to, uh, to take center stage, but indeed we wanted to give you an opportunity to exchange uh, some experiences about virtual teams. Um, and then of course, we'll dive into the seven deadly sins. We want to give it a bit of a positive spin at the end. So we do want to talk also about not just the sins, but what are some of the hacks and what are some of the tips um, about uh, communicating virtually in a team. And we will close uh, with, a, with a breakout discussion again. So just for, for you to bear in mind over the next hour, we'll be taking many questions. Uh, we'll open the floor to questions, but we have somewhere around 450 participants at the moment, maybe a bit more. So I want to encourage you and ask you to send your questions to Michael privately. So Michael will manage all the questions and he'll direct them back to me just to avoid the distraction of me being on the chat all the time. So um, do send your questions to Michael. And, uh, and this is how we'll, in case I, I am not able to answer all of the questions, I will give you my contact at the end. And uh, I look forward to exchanging with you offline about some of your questions. Okay. So look, um, you know, we, we all remember this last year, right? We were all fascinated by the dad who was giving an interview on the BBC and then his kids walked in and uh, we were all kind of sympathetic to this, to this father. And he, of course, handled it brilliantly. He kept his composure. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that today we're all this uh, BBC dad, right? We're all, we kind of feel his pain and we're all working from home or most of us working from home in the current challenging times. And... Um, you know, there are, of course, specificities about virtual teams. And I made the effort. I, I thought, you know, we will be sharing some research. But let me actually jump to a page that, you know, everybody is probably going to jump to, which is Wikipedia, and see how do they actually define virtual teams. And, of course, no surprise, they say this usually refers to a group of individuals who rely on technology to collaborate. Uh, what I found really funny, and I, I was entertained by this, is that they, they said, you know, email, fax, and video. So let me say right now that if you are relying on fax, leave the webinar immediately. You're going to learn nothing. Um, but indeed, obviously, the main point is we rely on technology to collaborate. And again, technology can be a, a, an opportunity, but it can also be a great challenge. So we'll focus uh, on this today. Let me say how we will dive in immediately. So we will shortly invite all of you to join the breakup rooms. We will split you in small groups of four and we will take roughly seven minutes uh, to check in and to, uh, and to dive in. 
what I will ask you to do is this screen will disappear when, when you join the breakout room. So if you can kindly take your phone and just snap this uh, screen so you have the instructions in front of you as you discuss with your peers. Um, and I'm inviting you to share maybe 15 seconds or 20 seconds of introduction each. You know, what's your first name? What's the industry you come from? What's your nationality? And then also maybe what's your hobby? What's your passion? Um, uh, to, to share with each other, like a blitz uh, introduction. And then what Michael and I are really curious about is for your virtual team, you know, the team that you spend most of your time uh, at, your, for your virtual team, the main challenges to its effectiveness, what are these, you know? Is it the frequency and the rhythm of meetings? Is it something related to engagement? Is it something related to the clarity of the expectations? the emotional connection, the personalized attention, or is it purely just the technological capability of the different uh, team members? So please snap the, snap the screen. So let's just dive in, <clears throat> okay? So let's dive into, uh, into the seven sins. So I'm really curious, first of all, maybe to ask Vincent to just share the poll that we had for all of you. And we're just curious if you could fill in a few options from the from what you discussed in the breakout rooms or what you heard from uh, me just now in, in the bigger discussion. Um, what is for you the main barrier to virtual, uh, to, to virtual communication, particularly in the team that you have been spending most of your time in, you know? Where do you see um, these barriers? And I can see the results live. I hope that all of you can see the results as we, uh, as we speak. So we have so Michael, this is interesting, right? So we have. I, think, I don't think they can see it yet. I think we'll have to. You'll have to share the poll results in a moment. So maybe we'll. Vincent will share. We're at two hundred people who have filled it in. Uh, so let's give it a few more seconds. So what I'm seeing definitely emerge as a trend is the engagement of participants, it not being as even, and the emotional connection, uh, for sure. Yes. So let's just give it a few more seconds. But that's interesting, right? We all face these barriers. So what is the one that, that um, mm -hmm. creates the biggest obstacle to our virtual teams? Very cool. Fantastic. OK, Vincent, let's end the poll and just share what we see. OK, wonderful. Um, can you, can, Michael, can we see the screen? So Michael, you know, that's, that's interesting to me. Um, so the engagement of participants uh, and, and the emotional connection, these are quite close, right? And we do, we do plan to spend some time talking about <clears throat> how do we even out the engagement and what can we do about the emotional connection on a, 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 on a, virtual, uh, on a virtual team meeting. It's interesting also to see that personalized attention is so low. So let's, let's spend some time discussing uh, all of these, but in particular, Maybe we can raise the awareness about why personalized attention on a virtual team matters. Right, Michael? Yeah, yeah. Great. Participants very high. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's Fantastic. Jump in. Let's jump in. So, <clears throat> so we will start with the first one. And the first one, the first really deadly sin, I call skipping the beat. Right. And what I mean by skipping the beat is really, and, and I'm a huge music fan and rock and roll fan. And I've always been interested in the role of the drummer in a, in a rock and roll band. You know, they usually don't receive that much attention, but um, or as much attention as the lead singer. But I've always been fascinated about this role. And if you all think about your favorite song, you know, think about what it would be like or what it would would put sound like without the sound or without the beat, right? And there's no reason why we should be thinking of teams any differently. Teams also depend on a rhythm and they depend on the frequency with which we have the, the meetings. And so what I wanted to share with you is uh, some insight from research about teams that have a rhythm, particular virtual teams that have a rhythm of meeting uh, versus teams that have no rhythm of meeting. And <clears throat> Yeah, Michael? So I have a quick question for you. So on the slide, you have interaction intensity. What do you mean by that? Yes. I mean, interaction intensity, you can think about uh, what, you know, if you think about your typical meeting, what, how many ideas do you generate? 
How many solutions do you generate? What is the quality of the decisions? Um, what is the airtime uh, between participants? Uh, do, do people speak an equal amount? So there will be these will be indicators of how intense are these uh, are these interactions. So <clears throat> what we find is that the the more we have a rhythm, the more the interactions become intense. The, the more often we have intense interactions. Right? Why, why would rhythm matter in that way? Why would that yeah, help? I mean, that's a good question, you know, but rhythm matters because of three things, right? Uh, the first reason why rhythm matters is it gives your team members a sense of predictability, right? And predictability, what it then does is predictability allows us to go or enter a habit of routines. We want to have a routine of preparation. You all know, and I'm sure that, you know, you all know that uh, a, 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 virtual, uh, a virtual meeting is of much higher quality when participants come prepared. And so preparation matters a huge deal. So when you have a rhythm, it allows participants or, or, or your virtual team members to come prepared and, and to have this sense of predictability. And then there's a third reason why that's important. The third reason is that with a, a regular rhythm or frequency of your meetings, you also meet when you don't necessarily need to. I want to invite you all to think about uh, your ad hoc meetings, right? You call it a virtual meeting because you have to. Uh, and what it then does is your team suddenly is very task focused. You know, you start talking about the project and the presentation and what's next. But in fact, what we need on virtual teams is to also meet when there's a freer agenda, when there's less on the agenda, right? Um, and I want to invite you all to think, where would you be? Would you be in the upper corner of the slide or would you be on the lower um, portion of the slide? Michael, what about you? Where would you... What, 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 when you think about your virtual team meetings, what, where do you fall? I think we've been a disaster. I mean, <laughs> the, the coronavirus came in and everything's been just ad hoc. And so yeah. we, we meet when we need to meet and we don't always get the right people in the room. Yes. And so, I mean, if I was going to put it on a scale from one to 10, 10 being really great. Yes. I would give us a 1.5. Wow. Wow, that's right. I'm going to jot these down. Actually, I'm going to evaluate myself on the on these seven. Okay. okay wow. That, that's that's pretty low, Michael. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty, for sure. But the first uh, thing, and let me say that as we move through the seven deadly sins, we'll start with some things that are simpler to implement, perhaps, and move to things that are a bit more tricky and a bit more elusive, perhaps. But this one is something that's a slam dunk, right? This is something we can do very easy. We can set up this, uh, this regularity in our meetings. The second one is a really, really critical one and is a killer for virtual teams. It's a killer. Um, it's what I call some are together and some are apart. And what I mean is, with, you know, if I had to visualize it, this is how I would visualize it, you know? Um, whenever some of you or with your colleagues or your team members work in the same building, you kind of do, you know, you kind of do this, um, this scenario over here and you say, well, let's all get together in a room and, you know, let's, because we're co-located, we'll just get in the same room together. And everybody who is, you know, tuning in from around the globe, they'll tune in from their own computer. Now this is, the reason why I say this is a killer is it because it really kills the team dynamic. And the reason why that is, is you don't share the same context. You just don't share the same context. So a, yeah. question, a question for you then on this is, am I getting this right that you're saying that if you have part of your team virtual, but the others are in the headquarter. Yeah. The people in the headquarters shouldn't be together on that virtual call? Yes, that's, that's exactly what I mean. They should so not call. That's pretty counterintuitive. It is. And, and, it's, and it, it not only is it counterintuitive, Michael, it's something that's very hard to, imp turns out to be harder to implement than, uh, than I thought, right? Because there's an instinct that, because you and I would both be at IMD, we have to have the call from the same location. Right, and so you're absolutely right. It is counterintuitive. So I, I mean, it's kind of interesting because we think, well, in-person meetings, 
are richer meetings because there's a lot more information flow and you feel closer and so on and so forth. Yeah. So if I hear you right, what you're saying is we should be willing to sacrifice yes. some of that so yes. that everybody feels equally like on their own yes. on the same playing field. Yes, yes. Michael, you're right on money, right on money. Uh, and we, we have to sacrifice it for the following reason, right? On the, the team that is co-located, there's a much higher likelihood that they have a side conversation, something that the other team members just don't hear. And that's a killer. Another killer is that you have the camera zoomed out. And so what the people uh, tuning in are seeing is a bunch of, you know, a group with the camera zoomed out. And what they miss is the facial expression. The, um, they miss some of that context that all of you have. And so it does create a bit of an in-group, out-group uh, dynamic, which is never helpful to any team. Okay. Right? So, so there are a few questions coming in from chat. Maybe I'll, I'll give sure, you Sure, yeah, please. There's some repetition across them. So um, now we are all far away. Do you think it is still that detrimental effect? And I guess your idea is, well, if everybody's equally distributed, then we don't have this issue. Yes. And also there are formats and formats. We are not all, you know, 500 people who are tuned in. We're not all a team. And this is more of a presentation format. But yes, indeed, when we're talking about a team, I would actually highly recommend that you separate, even if you are co-located. Yes. Michael? Another question. Do you have any neuroscience background behind this? I guess, is there any research behind this? Oh, yeah, there is research about it. And what we can do after the webinar is we can send people the references and the links about where, where this is coming from. Absolutely, yes. Okay, Perfect. thank you for these questions, and I'm noting this. Um, what, what is also then, on the other hand, happening is, you know, as we separate, as we have these folks who are tuning in with a bit of a disadvantage about the contextual understanding uh, of the situation, right? Versus a scenario like this, where we're all in front of our computers and the camera is all on our face, um, and it's the same context for everybody, and the facial expressions are as visible as possible, right? So the, the second point is very much about allowing everybody to have the same context, right? Thank you. So the third one is also uh, kind of an easy, an easy one to implement, I think, but it's shocking, or at least to me it is. I don't know if it's shocking to you, Michael, but to me it's shocking how often um, I am presented with this challenge. And the challenge, I, I call it see you not, which is literally the scenario where I'm, on a, I'm meeting my team, whether it's a project team or a, or a program team, and some of us are tuned in via video and some are not and you just hear them. And that's a challenge, right? <laughs> Thank so you, Michael. What you're saying, that's <laughs> disconcerting for you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is, it is concerning for me, Michael. Yes, it's concerning to me right now that I can't see you. Um, absolutely, and it is, it, the, the reason why it is, is you might be, if you have your camera off, you might be perfectly engaged, and you, know, you might know that, but your team members do not. And so naturally, there are doubts about the, your level of engagement. And then this, the consequence of this is this engagement is contagious. So if I think now Michael has his camera turned off, well, you know, I have license to do the same. So let me just also kind of, well, people don't need to see me. I can email on the side. So this engagement is contagious. Some, some really interesting comments on the side that are adding to the conversation, I think. One is to save bandwidth and pressure on our organization's network, we've been advised to use audio, not video. It somewhat detracts from the intimacy of the meetings. Yes. So the speaker switches on their video when they're speaking, we take turns. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it is, a, this is a practical concern and it's an important one. Of course, it adds to the bandwidth, absolutely. There's another one about culture, saying it's also a cultural thing. In Switzerland, very, people, very few are using the CAM in the US a lot are. Yes, yes. Absolutely. And I agree. There is something, I mean, it, it takes getting used to. I have to say that I myself resisted the camera for a long time. I mean, who likes a camera being just kind of spotlighted on, your, on their face? It's, it's, it's awful. But, but the reality is that it, it does help if your team puts you a little bit under pressure because it helps the quality of the conversation. And of course, what you have in the scenario on the right is your emotions are visible, 
and your engagement is more contagious. So everybody becomes more, more engaged, and that is, uh, that is the key. But I hear the question on the practical side. Any other questions we have, Michael? Well, a lot of them. Um, yeah, another bandwidth question. Yes. I think people also have issues with privacy. Sometimes these are being done from home. Yes, that's true. I mean, if we think back to the BBC dad, right, with, with his kids coming into the background and, and uh, babies rolling in and, and, and so on and so forth, it's not a scenario you want. But at the same time, and, and Michael, you and I will talk about this, at the same time, I do feel that we need to relax some of the assumptions about working from home, right? Uh, we, 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 we keep saying or we keep thinking that your home needs to be, you know, you, you can't have babies in the background or kids, but these are unspoken expectations and we need to relax some of them, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the boundary is being blurred at the moment. Yeah. So moving into the fourth sin is one that I call just launching. And by, by saying just launching, I mean just launching into the task, right? And the reason why this is, um, why I include it as a deadly sin is that every task that you perform, it could be that you're putting a presentation together, it could be that you're putting a report together or you're analyzing something, uh, you're putting a budget together, the, every conversation requires a conversation about how you're gonna have the conversation, right? Um, and if you think about even, I'm giving an example with a very complex task like uh, landing on the moon, but if you think about astronauts, there's a reason why the, the NASA traditionally emphasizes team dynamics and the quality of the conversations among the team members, right? And so there's a level of preparation that you need on any team, but particularly on a virtual team, right? Particularly on a virtual team. And what I, and I want to separate these conversations uh, here. The first one is you need to have a conversation about how you will work together. This is just about the rules, you know? And Michael, you and I had a chat about this uh, the other day that it, th these, these rules can be various. It could be what are going to be the hours in which you're going to be tuning in? How, you know, how fast are you going to be expected to respond? Um, camera on, off, bandwidth, questions, etc. tools. You know, this is just about how do you work uh, mm -hmm. together. What's, right. what's, what's interesting in, in my experience so far, especially with coronavirus, is we don't do this at all. We're all so stressed out about all the changes. So we, we dive right into the tasks. Yes. And we don't have any ground rules about how we're going to operate. Usually in the real world, we're, we're, I'm pretty bad at that anyway. But in this world, we seem to be, to be even worse. Especially vulnerable. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you think about what the, the, the disadvantage that this brings is, you know, we, we jump on a, on a team meeting communication and we have divergent expectations. You know, Michael expects one thing, I expect another, and it's hard to align unless we really do discuss the rules. And um, on the other hand, if we do discuss the rules, we have, there's evidence that teams are much more effective when they have um, implemented these discussions about team rules and, and or a team charter even, right? Then there's also another layer of conversations that virtual teams need to have. And this is not about how they will work together, but it's about how they feel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we call this checking in. It's as simple as this. How do we feel coming into this call today? Um, you know, Michael, you were sharing with me just before the call what had happened to you this morning, you know. Um, so what do we bring into a conversation? How do we feel? And that's an important thing. We don't do this, do we, typically? It seems especially, again, especially important in, in virtual settings where maybe in the real world you sit down and you see somebody with a long, sad face and you engage them a little bit before the meeting starts up. But yes. in the virtual world, maybe we just don't get those signals, so we have to no. attend to it more consciously. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, here, what I want to highlight one thing, and I want to ask you all to kind of reflect on this. I've been hearing from a lot of team members uh, on, on different team meetings that I've had virtually, a lot of people saying, I've been bloody tired. 
You know, I've been bloody tired because I have Zoom or Skype or whatever WebEx meetings all day. And I'm more tired than when I have these meetings face to face. And that resonated with me because I felt the exact same way. And my explanation is exactly this check-in, that we're more inclined to do this check-in when we're face to face. You know, how are you feeling? How are you doing? And that gives a breather, right? You come into a conversation, you suddenly, okay, wow, it gives you a bit of space to process what's been before, what's coming next. And in contrast, when we do these virtually, we skip these, right? We skip the check-ins and we launch right into the task. We, we go straight to the moon without checking, what is the team that I'm going to the moon with, right? Uh, and so that contributes to a sense of feeling tired. And so if you're feeling tired, there's an explanation for it. Uh, probably other explanations as well, but this is one. And then, of course, checking in on how we feel, there's a lot of evidence that it increases the bonding, it increases the trust, and it cre- increases the level of engagement. All of these contributing to psychological safety on teams. It's interesting. There's a lot of chats coming in saying, yes, yes, yes. This is exactly my experience on, on a lack of... Uh, not surprised, right? Michael, we're not surprised. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you are tired, this is, or if you are experiencing this fatigue, please jump to this solution because it will, it will help. It might not solve, but it will help. And it's a major reason why you are feeling so tired. So, uh, uh, another follow-up question. Yes. Have is how much time should we spending, be spending on this check-in? And should we, question. should we expect to accomplish as much in a face-to-face meeting as in, in, a, in a virtual meeting as a face-to-face meeting, given all of these extra requirements for virtual teams? Wonderful, wonderful question. So I would, I would hesitate to give a recipe about how much, how much time. I would say... If you give people the opportunity, you will, if you're the team leader, uh, you will feel that need very quickly. You will see if people have a high need to spend some more time on the check-in or not. What I also suspect is that if you do these check-ins regularly, they will, they, you know, maybe they will start being really long. And then over time, you will get again into a rhythm of doing these check-ins and they will become, people will get to the essence more quickly and probably more honest and more open about how they feel. So I'm going back to this notion of habits, right? If this becomes a routine, um, I'm not saying that this should become um, kind of, that we should just check mark, you know, oh, how do you feel, Michael? Oh, you feel well, very good, let's move on. That's not what I mean, right? But if it becomes a routine in your meetings, uh, this space will be, it will enable people to just take up this space, right? So it's a good question, but I would hesitate to tell you, you know, take up 5% of your meeting for a check-in because it will vary, especially now with coronavirus or the turbulent times, you're probably experiencing a high degree for people to just share how they feel. So we have a, a couple of questions that are around trust. Yes. One says, this is important to create trust between team members. And another says, doesn't this require trust if we've never done it before? Amazing, amazing question. But it, it is, a, I agree that to some extent it could be a vicious cycle. But as a, if, if you are the team leader on these um, virtual team meetings, do try to break that vicious cycle. And you can break it with a check in. You're right that they will work if there is a foundation, they will work initially better if there is a foundation of trust. Mm-hmm. But you can also contribute to that trust uh, uh, with that. Very good idea to set ground rules with our, yes, absolutely. Yeah, Michael? And, and then there's somebody who almost came up with a solution to one of our own problems that we've generated as a, as a group. And it says, we've been doing check-in for a while. It's true. It helps to reduce fatigue. And you just need to get used to it. Then it goes quite quickly. You, people just need to get used to tapping into how they're feeling. And so they can yeah. share it relatively. Uh, yeah, quickly. absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah, good. Wonderful. Thank you all for these uh, reflections. Um, the fifth one is a bit of a, it's a pet peeve of mine, Michael, and you know this, right? So I, first of all, I don't think that it's specific to virtual teams. I, I find enough teams in corporations and companies today who literally have forgotten how to have fun and are so stiff and uptight. Um, so this is not specific to virtual teams, but it's even more um, 
vital perhaps because we don't have these signals and emotions you know having fun is very important michael is doing a live demonstration thank you michael um of having fun and introducing a bit of silliness and a bit of um foolishness on these teams right and and I'll, I'll explain a little bit the benefits of this and, and why it's important, but I've been following a lot of the late uh, show hosts in the US, right? And they're all doing their shows from home, etc. And the first thing I've been noticing is there's a, a great trend at the moment of um, not selfies, but team fees, right? So you, you snap your team on the, on the virtual call. So there's been a wave of team fees. Mm -hmm. uh, team fees around, but Jimmy Kimmel did this amazing, uh, amazing uh, song rendition on Zoom with uh, of the song called uh, stuck in the middle right and i thought the text was just so amazing uh, stuck in the middle you know clowns to the left jokers to the right here i am stuck in the middle with you uh, and i thought this was you know spot on uh, coronavirus crisis type song but of course they've been trying to do to get creative while they're at home another amazing idea i saw online as well is jimmy kimmel introduced formal fridays right because he's been hosting in his sweatpants for forever and the T-shirt, so he introduces now formal Friday. So he dresses up on Fridays with a uh, with his suit and tie. Uh, but on the whole, you know, this the first thing I was interested in is what are some of our unspoken expectations about virtual communication? Why is it that we resist having fun? Some of you may jump in right away with the chat and say, actually, I'm having more fun on virtual teams. If you are, let us know how and why and, and what helps you have more fun on these teams. But I do think, Michael, this is a, a big, there's something about the, these unspoken expectations. And this right? is actually interesting. One of the comments was fun versus distraction. How much fun do you allow? Ah. Right? So there's, there's this idea that it's, it's a very, something we should be controlling. I mean, for me, it, it relates back to what we know about psychological safety. And actually, the more bonding you have in a team, actually, the much more of, um, yeah. effective outcomes you tend, tend to get. Yes. So yes. It's, it's not a zero-sum game. No, no, it's not. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. So fun, I mean, Michael, if we go back to some of the psychological defense mechanisms, we know that joking and excessive joking is a defense mechanism. Humor can be a defense mechanism, right? We know that. But it, so, so it's a very nice question on what is the balance between the right amount of fun and then the right amount of focus. Yeah, and, um, and it might be that if it is a defense mechanism, something needs to be defended, right? So right now, we might a lot of us be carrying a fair amount of stress and fear and anxiety yes. and uncertainty. Yes. And if it comes out in fun because that's a defense mechanism, maybe it's, it's needed. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And, and I'm also wondering about these unspoken uh, expectations, right? We expect the virtual teams because we have maybe less time together or because it's not face-to-face, -face, it has to be serious, and we have to jump into the task, you know, going back to the Apollo uh, example and launching into task, task, task mode. Um, Whereas maybe we need to readjust our expectations and say, mm -hmm. look, virtual teams are just about, you know, we, we meet like we meet face to face and fun. If we, what's, what's interesting is a few people are saying we shouldn't be regulating fun and others are actually saying, you know, we, we in our team, we set aside time for pure fun. We are nice. just nice. socializing and, and catching up because we find, feel that it re-energizes the team. Yes. That's a very nice comment. I'll, I'll say, <laughs> I'll share something. I'm half German, so I, I apologize to my German compatriots who are on the call, but um, I was working with a German company <laughs> a while ago, and when, we're, when I was talking about playfulness and fun in organizations, the, after my session, they had implemented a time for fun, and they had structured fun. And I was like, folks, this is not exactly what I meant, right? But it's, it, of course, you can't structure it, and you can't force it, and you shouldn't. But, it's, um, but it is an important consideration uh, for, for all of us, right? Thank you. And going back to this, uh, to, to just closing on this note, fun or the, the notion of playfulness, it gives people the license to be creative, the license to be even fool, foolish, right? And we know how important this is for innovation. So if you want to maintain innovation and the momentum of innovation on a virtual team you need this it's not just a good to have it's a must have right so that's uh that's critical 
I want to um, move now to something that's called the one size fits all, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, we're all, if you think about the people that are on, the, on your team, right, your team members, they will be most likely of very different personalities. And you, what, what we want to avoid is structuring team meetings and structuring the communication around the needs of a few. Uh, rather than the, the needs of, of most of us or all of us. So to be less inclusive in the way we structure them. So one of the things I want to invite you to do is think about the different personalities and in particular, what are some of the traits where people are quite divergent? You know, the typical example would probably be extroversion and introversion. And what are some of the needs or preferences that they have uh, that might translate or uh, carry over in virtual teams. And if I go back to our example of a, the team rules, right, creating the rule book of how are we going to communicate together, this is the place where um, notions or uh, where we will know if we're all being inclusive leaders, right, and if we are thinking about psychological safety on our team. So that means that, for example, when we think about our weekly meetings or the time of our weekly meetings, we will consider aspects like, um, you know, is Michael, what are Michael's preferences? Is Michael an introvert or an extrovert? Or uh, will we give even Michael the space to voice some of these preferences and needs, right? And vice versa, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is something really important. And Michael, again, this is something we don't see very often on teams, on virtual teams. No, it, it just seems like virtual teams, in my experience, is just so much on the task, on the task. That, yes. that is for the, for the bonding, for the yes. personal needs. Absolutely. For the parents and needs, perhaps. Do you, yes. I have a question along those lines, Nina. Do you think that part of, I know that this session is really around team meetings per se, but do you think that part of a, a team leader's responsibility is actually to be doing some smaller interventions with different individuals outside of the main meetings just to ensure that everybody stays engaged? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for sure, like in a, any face-to-face -face meeting, we would probably meet, you know, a leader or team members would meet individually with each other in dyads, in triads. So this is a natural phenomenon and it will carry over in virtual teams as well. And that's uh, all good and good and fine. As long as it doesn't, um, it, as long as it doesn't digress into a complete side conversation, right? And this is something that again we should bear in mind. Um, team team processes are team processes, and it's important to spell out what are we doing on the side and what are we doing together. So this is something that we need to clarify. Yeah. And then I have a, another question from somebody, and they said, "This is all of these points are super helpful." But what if I'm running a really big virtual team? Yes. Okay, great point. Kind of great like point. Town, town hall virtual teams. Yes. So thank you for that question. So this, this, this almost invites a bigger question of what is a team and um, what, is, you know, what is the right size of a team? I'll go back to the famous, um, I think it was Jeff Bezos from Amazon who said, if you can't feed a team with two pizzas, it's too big. <laughs> Right. And I don't mean to say that you should not be leading such a big team. That's not what I'm saying. But there are uh, there are kind of uh, challenges associated with the size of the team. Uh, and what we tend to clarify is you may have a large number of direct reports. But what's important to see is to what extent are these direct reports interdependent of one another. So to, the, to what so we define a team by the interdependency. Right. And so if it's a team with, if you are leading many people and they all report to you and some are interdependent, but it's not a requirement, that's one story. But if you're leading a really large team with a high number of interdependencies, that is a massive challenge as well as face-to-face -face as it is virtually. So the first thing I would say is when you're having the virtual team calls, there's different purposes. If, you have, if you're having a meet, virtual team meeting just for informing people, you can have as many people on the line as, 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 as you wish. But we do say that every time we go past the double digit, you know, into, when we enter the double digits, it becomes very heavy. 
for the dynamics, for the relationships. So it is quite important if you're expecting interaction in the team meeting call or video conference, try to limit to below 10 people. Because so it even six and eight. Meeting, then you do need a smaller group. If it's information exactly. sharing, it's a, it's a different dynamic. A lot of Absolutely. these might not yes. be so relevant in that context. Excellent. Absolutely. And let me then just finish with a point that is um, important, but also quite, uh, I would call it quite sophisticated in terms of its implementation. I call it checking out without a checkout. What I mean is, imagine every time you're finishing your virtual meeting, right? And you're all running around in different directions. You're ready to go and jump on the next meeting. You know, you're already, your mind, you're checking out you're elsewhere already. And what we know for a fact is that we always, any meeting, right, face-to-face -face as well, but in particular, virtual meeting, we need to end with a question of how was this meeting for everyone? How was it for all of us? And each of us needs to say, again, uh, we want to avoid things like, Michael, how was this meeting for you? How was this call, Michael? Mm -hmm. Pretty good, right? It was pretty good. We want to avoid that type of checkout. So this is absolutely not what I mean. But what I do mean, and I'll give you a, a, an amazing example that a banker once shared with me. It was an executive from a British bank. And he said, here's what I do on a virtual team for a checkout, for a checkout. And I loved his idea and his example. He said, at the end of every meeting, uh, I ask my team members, uh, to literally write down, and I asked them on a scale of one to 10, how was this meeting for you? Rate the quality of our meeting, the quality of our interactions, and the quality of our exchange. Everybody jots down a number, and then we're simultaneously, so let's say I give it a seven, we're all simultaneously putting up the score up for everybody to see. And he said, you know, what was interesting at the beginning was everybody was giving tens. Right? Oh, it was perfect. It was great. The meeting was fantastic. And he said, as the team leader, I started probing people. And I started saying, why was this, how was this a 10 for you? Right? Why was it a 10? What, what made you think that this was a high quality meeting? So he said, when I started probing people and, and asking a bit more about their ratings or their numeric ratings, they started seeing that they will have to justify this somehow. And this became for them a very, very effective way of not only giving, uh, giving, uh, uh, thinking about the team process, but also rating the quality of the team interactions. And that does uh, seem like a really good way to increase actually the bonding as well. Yes. When we start pulling away the layers of, oh, everything is perfect. Yes. And figuring out how could we actually do better. That would be, that would be really interesting. Absolutely. Really Absolutely, cool. Michael. If, if I think here, and I'll highlight three things uh, about what a, what a proper checkout, not a just kind of simulated checkout, but what a proper checkout does is it helps people make sense. This is very important. There's a lot of research on the importance of sense making in organizations. If you think about what you're doing in your companies at the moment, you're probably also sense making of the coronavirus or the events at the moment. What does it mean for us as an organization? What does it mean for us as a team? Just hearing your voice uh, helps you go through some of that, right? Another really important aspect is, of course, it helps the team process. Mm -hmm. If you give the, the, the virtual meeting a five, you will probably share with your team and you'll say, you know, the reason why I gave it a five is I thought we weren't all present. I thought, you know, a lot of us were on emails. I didn't feel the focus. It's, it's a way of giving each other or the whole group rather uh, feedback. And then there's a, a, a last point, which I think is also very important. I mean, think of your suitcase, literally the baggage that you will then bring into another meeting. Mm. If you haven't properly checked out, you bring that baggage and that luggage with you. And that's something that the next virtual team or the next virtual meeting doesn't necessarily need. And so and this, and this really goes back to the point that you're making about kind of getting in and checking in first, right? Yes. You go straight to launch. And so this is kind of the back end. You need time. Absolutely. Perhaps even more in a virtual context to really yes. gain focus and be present in this moment. 
Yes. And at the end, you also need some time to, to, to switch off and be ready for what's coming next. I imagine this is even yeah. a bigger issue if you have three-year-old kids crawling around on the floor. Oh my God, even more, even more. And I wish we all had a bit more tolerance for that and a bit more, and actually we do. I actually find that we do, we don't have tolerance for ourselves, right? Because if I saw Michael, if I saw your kids around the house, I wouldn't, I'd be like, great, I'm, I'm seeing Michael's daughters. But you know, if my son was running around here, I'd be like, ah, oh, bloody, you know, what, damn it. So I think there is a kind of self care almost that we're missing, don't you think? I, I do, and I've also found that if I give my children some tranquilizers in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that works. That bloody works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me, yeah, so let me then just briefly summarize, um, and I, we should make a disclaimer, Michael, please don't give your kids any tranquilizers. Um, so if, if I summarize these seven sins, right, but what we want to do at the end is we want to convert them to, rather than sins, convert them to the do's. So moving from the don'ts, moving to the do, from the don'ts to the do's, um, really keeping up the rhythm. And this is about predictability and preparation, right? Give your team a possibility to prepare and have a sense of predictability. The second one, separate instead of collocate, meaning give them the same amount of context. This is all about context. Camera on, this is because of the emotions and the engagement, right? You, we need the camera so we can, you know, you can see that at the moment I'm smiling or I'm pissed off or I'm, you know, something's bugging me. So we need that kind of visual. Absolutely essential. Um, talking before launching, right? We're not going to land on the moon if we don't know what are we doing, how are we working together and how are we feeling, right? Playing, I absolutely believe in this big time. Um, individual, just kind of individualizing uh, and personalizing uh, the, the, the virtual team experience. This is absolutely important also because of the inclusion. We will have different needs, we will have different preferences, we will have different um, setups, like you say, family, uh, context, etc. And then the final one is checking out with intent, right? Leaving the baggage, making sense, and checking out kind of intentionally. Mm. I yeah. This, yeah is, this has been super useful. Thank you. Thank you for all of this. Just to share a few comments, I'm not alone. Sure. <laughs> but as you know, I came into this with the intention of learning stuff as, as, as a participant. Sure. And I have. I've been taking lots of notes. I see lots of areas for improvement. Okay. Nice thank yous. Someone says, the most important material since Corona. Please do share the materials. Do we get a copy of the slide sets? Can we see the webinar or share the webinar later? Of course, of course we will. Uh, we will absolutely. I also, what I also want to do is um, just share my, my contact details with people because I know we haven't been able to um, share all the, or answer all the questions that they had. So let me just end on also on the, uh, on my email and contacts. So um, my email, my contact, if you have any questions, do drop me a line. Uh, and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and we'll make sure to answer all the all the questions and give you of course also the materials we'll be in touch with you about the slides and the recording of this webinar absolutely yes fantastic thank you well we're closing correct yes we I think we're closing we wanted to have another breakout room but of course we are aware that there were some technological glitches so thank you for your patience at the beginning and um, and look forward to connecting with you offline Thank you all. Thank you, Ina. It's, Thank it's you all. Thank you. Have a lovely day and good luck. Stay healthy. <laughs> Bye, Michael. Bye.